We're studying this quarter a uh, topic called the Great I Am, as you can see. And two weeks ago, we began looking at the, a particular aspect uh, of God, and that being His holiness. And uh, we did not, we were not able to finish that particular discussion. So I want to try to finish that uh, today, but. When you think about the great I am, when you think about the first class in this series, we, we talked about the nature of God and how God is all powerful. He's all knowing. He's all present. Uh, he's an all loving God. You think about the various aspects of our God. In your mind, what do you think about when you think about the holiness of God? What is it about God that makes him holy? God is sinless. God is sinless and has no association uh, with evil at all. We mentioned two weeks ago that perhaps this is the most crucial of all of the qualities of God for us to understand. You know, there, there are so many qualities that that's a statement that, that may be a bit bold uh, to make. But there's no, other, there's no other quality in the Bible that's mentioned three times in a row like holy, holy, holy is. There's something about the holiness of God that sets him apart. There's something about the holiness of God, a, a topic that's mentioned over 600 times in your Bible. It would have no meaning. It would have no definition. It would have no purpose, this idea of holiness, if it were not for God. The idea of holiness means that whatever is holy, including God, is separate, set apart, Sacred, sanctified. We talked last time about the fact that the holiness of God means that he transcends everything that, that, that we can think of. The Bible says that he transcends all peoples, all nations. He is above all the earth. He's above all the heavens. He is the great God who is above all gods. He is exalted far above all gods. He is to be feared above all gods because in summary, he's just above all. The holiness of God means that, that he transcends everything that you and I know. There's nothing like our God. The idea that he transcends all also talks about the fact that there is only one God. There, there's, not, there's not a multiple choice. There, there's, not a, there, there's not a pick the best one for you and somebody else can pick the best one for him. There's only one God. And the holiness of God not only emphasizes that there's only one God, but it emphasizes his unique nature. The question is asked in uh, Exodus chapter 15, who is like you, O Lord? What's the answer? Is there anybody like the Lord? There, there, there is not only no other God, there is no other God that, there, there's nothing else that compares to God. No one is holy like the Lord. There is no God in heaven above or on earth below like the God of heaven. So when we talk about our Father in heaven, when we talk about the, the, the God of all heaven and earth, it's a God that, that has absolutely no comparison. We started last week, I believe, looking at this, um, and, uh, and I want us to continue in, in, this, in this particular study this morning. If we want to understand the holiness of God, I think we can do that by looking at three particular areas. One, and, and this, is what we this is the only thing we got through, uh, this is as far as we got two weeks ago. And that is that when you talk about the holiness of God, you see that the holy God, and this is what Joe said, cannot be associated with evil. It is, it is against the very nature of God. To have any association with evil or with sin. I want you to think about that. The Bible says, how many does the Bible say have sinned? Romans chapter 3 and verse 23. Oh, you know that verse, do you? The Bible says that God is not a God who takes pleasure in wickedness. The Bible says that God's eyes are too pure, they are too holy to behold evil. The Bible says in Isaiah 59 that our sins is that which separates us from God. 
God can have absolutely no association with evil or sin at all, and he does not make any exceptions. Did he make an exception with his son? When the Bible says that the iniquity of us all, Isaiah 53, I think it's verse 6, where it says the Lord is laid upon him. The Lord laid upon Christ as he was upon that cross, laid upon him the iniquity, the sin of every person. Well, can the God of heaven be associated with evil? Can he look upon evil? His eyes are too pure. Is there any evil in him at all? Could he make an exception for his own son? When Jesus said, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? It was because of this point. So I want us to to reflect upon when we think about God being holy. Yes, he transcends all. He is above all. Think about God. There is no other God like him. But when you think about God, think about him in relationship to sin. What does that say about my relationship with sin? What does that say about what my relationship should be towards sin? Easy going? It's okay. Everybody else is doing it, so so it's okay for me to do it. Avoid it at all costs. If we want to understand the holiness of God, not only do we look at the fact that he cannot be associated with evil, but look at just the, the other side of that coin, and that is that God, if he cannot be associated with evil has set himself apart, separated himself, that's what holy means, unto that which is the very opposite of evil, and that's righteousness. Think about some of these verses. Um, Throughout the Bible, this is taught. The Bible says that the way of the Lord is righteousness and justice. The very foundation of his throne is righteousness and justice. What does that mean? To, To you, what does that mean? The way of the Lord is righteousness and justice. What does that mean in a practical sense? Bill? It means the foundation, everything is built upon that. Everything extends upward and outward. Okay. Everything about God is built upon that foundation. Is there any aspect of God that is not focused on righteousness? Is there any aspect of our God that would, that, that would be contrary to being just, being fair? It's at the very foundation of who He is. We, we learn in passages like Hosea chapter 14 and verse 9, as well as other places, that the ways of the Lord, everything about the Lord is right. So if I call something about God into question, why would God let this happen to me? Why would God allow all of this evil to take place? What association does God have with evil? Doesn't have any association. So if there is evil that is in the world, if there is evil that is is, uh, creating havoc in our world, Good idea to blame God for it? Can I, can, can I legitimately blame God for the evil that's around me? Why would God let that happen to that family? As if God stepped out of his righteousness, as if God stepped out of his justice for a moment in order to inflict some kind of pain or evil, and then he stepped back into his righteous and justice uh, throne. Joe? They are. How do we deal with that? Joe says evil, pain, and suffering are, are, are right at the very platform and the main platform that many atheists will stand upon to argue against the existence of God. How, how do we deal with that? How do we answer that? Most of the time, Chuck says, we deserve it. 
uh, the evil pain and the suffering? How do we deal with it? Bill? Christ was tempted in all points like as we are. Was Christ tempted by evil? Was Jesus tempted by evil? Yeah. All right. that's, that's who tempted him, right? The evil one is the one who tempted him. He wasn't tempting him with a Krispy Kreme donut. Okay, that, that's not evil um, most of the time. He's tempting him. Yeah, you know, uh, he's tempting him with that which is a violation and, and totally in contrast to the very nature and will of God. As Bill says, Christ was tempted and he resisted. Are we tempted? He's tempted in all points, just like we are. Can I resist temptation? Can I resist evil? Is evil a choice? Yes. When, when the atheists stand on a platform of evil, pain, and suffering and claim that it is God who has brought these things upon mankind, and, and I'm coming to you, Tasha, I see your hand, uh, that God has brought, somehow brought these things upon mankind. Well, what does the Bible say about that? The Bible says that in him is no darkness at all. The Bible says that God does not and cannot tempt or be tempted by evil. It's a, it's a violation of his very nature. And so does God cause evil, pain, and suffering? Or as they, as they phrase it, how could your loving God, they don't say that with uh, any, uh, any degree of respect, they say it out of derision, how could your loving God allow evil, pain, and suffering? If he was such a loving God, he'd get rid of those things. You know what our loving God has allowed us to have? Freedom of choice. Freedom of choice. A loving God has given to you and to me freedom of choice. He could have removed that, couldn't he? Could, couldn't our loving God have said, no, you don't get to choose your own path. I'm just going to remove that from you and make you robots. Is, 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 would, that have been, uh, would that have been a sign of love, of trust? Do you give your children freedom of choice? You try not to, right? But something in them, you know, it, it just grows and all of a sudden they get freedom of choice. Do you allow them to make choices on their own sometimes? Uh, sometimes. Uh, have you allowed them to uh, choose what they would wear or uh, what they might eat or not eat? But at some point you might draw a line. But you, learn, you help them to learn to make decisions. Let me, let me finish this up real quick and get to Tasha. Our loving God has given to each of us freedom of choice. Can I choose to do right? Yes. Can I choose to do evil? I can make that choice. Can my choice to do evil have an impact on anybody else for evil? Can my choice to do evil, if I go and murder somebody, can that have an impact on somebody else? Hmm, yeah, I'd think so. Can it have an impact on somebody else who learns about that? Can the choice to do evil have an impact for generations and generations and generations? Can we say Roe v. Wade? Has that had an impact and will it have an impact for generations and generations? Well, why is God allowing all of these babies to be slaughtered? Because man made a choice, not God. God exists on a throne that is characterized by righteousness and justice. Okay, Tasha, sorry, I ran all over the place there. Well, that's okay, but I mean, you said all of the things that indicate that we have free will and God allows those things to happen. 
There are choices that have consequences. And, and, and Tasha says that's where the justice of God comes in. The justice is the justice of God. Is it consistent with his nature? Or is he like you and kind of, you know, it depends on which kid it is. Or, you know, it depends on how much sleep you've had, you know, and, and where you draw the line. No, the justice of God is consistent. Kristen? And, and, and Christian says, for, for Christians, we've got the hope of heaven. You know, you look at, you look at, the, you look at these two points that, that we've talked about here. That the holiness of God, that very quality indicates that God is separate and he cannot be associated with evil. And by his very nature, he is righteous and just. But what about me? Romans chapter 3 and verse 10 says, There is none righteous, no, not one. That includes me. The Bible says in verse 23 that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So I'm stuck. I, I'm dead. I mean, if, if the nature of God is such, he cannot be associated, associated with evil. If the nature of God is such that he is fully righteous and I'm not, then I'm doomed. I'm lost. And that's where the grace of God comes in. What does the grace of God do? The grace of God takes that which is dirty and makes it clean. It takes that which is corrupt by sin and makes it pure and holy. Because of something I've done? Well, because of my faith and my obedience to the will of God. God extends His grace to allow me, a person unrighteous, to be viewed in His eyes as righteous. Somebody else had a hand up. Trudy? Yeah, that, that, that would make sense, wouldn't it? You know, evil, pain, and suffering happen, and Trudy says they, they shouldn't be blaming God, they should be blaming the evil one. Isn't that where evil comes from? Uh, June and then Trina. God has told us, uh, June says, you flee, uh, you flee uh, youthful lust, 2 Timothy 2, 22. You, you flee uh, fornication, 1 Corinthians 6, 18. You flee, you avoid idolatry, uh, 1 John 5 and 20 and other places. Um, he's told us to get away from it, but then given us the freedom of choice, do we do it or not? He's told us what to do, and then the justice of God is going to be there when we do or when we don't. He's told us, he's given us the commandments, and he's also told us what consequences of, of those things will be. Trina? So are you going to cover the requirements of us to be righteous before him on a daily basis? There are times when we just, because of our own
a good question. Dirk had his hand up. He's going to answer it. <laughs> oh, that's not what you were going to do? And, and, and so uh, get your Bibles, turn to 1 John chapter 1, and we're going to talk about what Trina brought up. Um, but uh, Dirk says, you know, you, you, at the same time that all of these evil things are happening, he particularly talks about those, those children who are aborted, the, the mercy and the grace of God uh, takes those children uh, right to heaven, Dirk says. And so while there are evil, that, evil things that are happening... Um, God is still in control. You know, it, while we're thinking about that, you and First John, flip back one page to Second Peter 2. Um, and I don't know if this ties in with what Dirk was saying or not. Look in Second Peter chapter 2 and verse 9. And then when you look in verse 9, back up to verse 7. In verse 7, talking about Lot and Sodom and Gomorrah, that God delivered righteous Lot, who was oppressed by the filthy conduct of the wicked. I want you to think about that. He says in verse 5, God didn't spare the ancient world in Noah's day, but uh, he flooded the world. Verse 6 says, God turned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes because of the sin that was in, that, in those cities. But then verse 7 says that God delivered. What did he do? He picked him up. He rescued righteous Lot. Was Lot Mr. Perfect? Uh, no. We won't talk about all the things we know that Lot did because they're not such nice things to talk about, are they? Was Lot Mr. Perfect? He was living in... Uh, in one of the most sinful realms that have ever existed on this earth. Was he not impacted by that? Not tempted by that? Not influenced by that? How can the Bible call him righteous Lot? Does that mean he, that he never sinned? No. But in the eyes of God, he was righteous. Why? Because he was different. He was set apart. He was holy. He was not like the others in that, in, in that city, in those cities. Lot had set himself apart. Isn't that what being holy is? Isn't that what God calls us to be? Was he perfect? No. Chuck, was that your hand? Okay. Has to do with the big picture. Was it a few hundred years ago you said that, John? Does it feel like that's what Chuck said? John Holzer said that a few hundred years ago, and uh, it, it, it may have been uh, that uh, you, you got to look at the big picture, and 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 that's what God does. God looks at the big picture. Here's righteous Lot. What does God do? He's in the midst of these wicked cities, and God delivers righteous Lot. Verse seven says that he was oppressed. Lot was. Anybody have a different word than the word oppressed? Sore distressed. What did you say, Bonnie? Filthy okay, Ed, talking about the filthy conduct of the wicked. He was sore distressed. He's worn out. He's tired out by the filthy conduct in Sodom and Gomorrah. Does that sound like you today with America? Are you oppressed and worn out? God delivered him. Verse 8. For that righteous man, it's the second time that God called him righteous. Wait a minute. He's not perfect. He's made mistakes. But when God looks at him, that righteous man dwelling among them, he tormented over and over. He tortured his righteous soul. Third time, 
The word righteous is used to talk about Lot. If you were to, if you were to make a list of Bible characters who you would describe in your mind as being righteous, before we read these two verses, would Lot have made your list? <laughs> no. Not, he's not in my top 10, probably not in my top 50. Three times in two verses, God called Lot righteous. Not because he was perfect, not because he never sinned, but because he had set himself apart. Lot tormented his righteous soul from day to day by seeing and hearing their lawless deeds. If the Lord does all of this, and if you go back to verse 4, is where you have the word if, if God did this, and if God did this, and if God did this, here's the then in verse 9. Then the Lord knows how to deliver the godly out of temptations. Does God know how to take care of you? Does God know when you are being tempted? Does God know when you need that way of escape? God knows how to deliver the godly out of temptation. And he knows how to take care of the rest of them. He knows how to reserve the unjust under punishment for the day of judgment. And especially those who walk according to the flesh in the lust of uncleanness, despise authority, who are presumptuous and self-willed, etc. God looked down at Sodom and Gomorrah. Abraham said, if I can find 50 righteous souls, 45 righteous souls, 40 righteous souls, 30. They couldn't find that many righteous souls. But when God looked down, he did see the righteous man. He did see righteous Lot. What allowed Lot to have that appearance before God? Now go to 1 John chapter 1. 1 John chapter 1. Look in verse 5. This is the message that we have heard from him, the one we have seen and heard and handled Jesus in those first four verses. This is the message that we have heard from Jesus and declare to you. That God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. That's exactly what we've been studying. That's the nature of God, is righteousness. The nature of God is no darkness at all. So if we say, verse 6, if we say that we have fellowship with him, and at the same time we walk in darkness, what's the result? We're lying. We're liars and we're not practicing the truth. Now, the verbs in this particular verse and in this particular passage are all in the present tense. And in the Greek, what that means in the present tense is that this is a continuous action. It's not a one-time thing or a here and there thing. It is a way of life. Read verse 6 again. If we keep on saying... That we have and we have and we're in great fellowship with God. But we are walking, 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 walking in darkness. If that's our lifestyle. Then we are lying and lying and lying and lying. And we are not doing anything to practice the truth. Is this talking about if I'm a Christian and I sin and I don't mean to? Is this talking about a Christian who's trying to live right and... Go back to what Trina said, and, and you just have one of those days where the devil has pushed every button you have to the point that you may even turn to God and say, God, what's up? God, what, why are you allowing? God, I don't understand. Where are you, God? If you've had one of those days, is that who this verse is talking about? No, this verse is talking about someone who has given their life over to walking in darkness. And yet they say while they're walking over in darkness, oh, I'm in, I'm in good fellowship with God. And God says, you're a liar. You don't know what you're talking about. Look at verse 7. But if we walk, present tense, it's a, it's an, it's a lifestyle. If we walk in the light... As he is in the light. We continually, present tense, have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses, present tense, 
continually cleanses us from all sin. So this verse says, if I live a perfect life and I never sin and I never disobey God and I never violate his will, that I will always have fellowship with him and he will always cleanse me from my sin. Is that what this verse says? Uh, no. Because the end of the verse says, you've got sins that need to be cleansed. This verse says, I can walk in the light, but at the same time, I've got sins that need to be cleansed. Wait a minute. If I've got sins that need to be cleansed, how can I be in the light? I can't be in the light because there's no darkness with God, but I've got sins. How does, how does that work? How can I be in fellowship with God in whom there is no darkness? And yet at the same time have committed a sin that's a violation of God and God can have no association with sin at all. How does that work? Mickey? Okay, Hebrews 10, 26 says, if we sin willfully, after that we've come to a knowledge of truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sin. But what does remain in verse 27 is a certain fearful expectation of judgment. Why? What's the difference? The sin in Hebrews 10, 26 is if we sin, what's the word? Willfully. Um, again, that is put in a context of it is a habitual lifestyle and choices that I make. I am choosing to continually violate the will of God. And God says, if you do that, there's no hope for you. Now, 1 John chapter 1 and verse 7. I have sins that need to be cleansed. Is this talking about willful sins of Hebrews 10, 26? Keep reading. I, I, I want to come back to verse 7, but just keep reading to see this context. If we say that we have no sin, notice verse 6. If we say we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we're liars. Verse 8, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins... My three favorite words in the Bible. He is faithful. He's righteous. He's just. He's holy. He can have nothing to do with my sins. But if I have a heart that says, God, I'm sorry. If we confess our sins... He is faithful and, what's the next word? Just. just. Comes back to Tasha's comment in relationship to everything that we have studied. God's justice, we think of justice sometimes as a negative idea. You know, if somebody goes to court, they might not want justice when they go to court because it might be a bad thing for them. They might end up having to suffer some consequences or something. But justice is not a bad word, is it? God is faithful and just. Where does the justice of God come in here? Who will forgive us of our sins and who will cleanse us from all unrighteousness. He's faithful and he's just because he has promised to do that. God promised that he would forgive me and that he would cleanse me and the justice of God demands that he do that. Dirk? Well, it works if we have made a conscious choice, like verse 7 says, in the blood of Christ. Yeah. Well, that's not what it says. Well, it says that. Absolutely. You, it's, it, it, is, it is for those who have made a conscious choice, Dirk says, to walk in the light and to be in and saved by the blood of Jesus. I want to come back to verse 7. Re, look in verse 10. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar. Verse 6, we were the liars. Now in verse 10, he's the liar. Because verse 9 says, God's not a liar. 
God made a promise about forgiving and he's faithful and just. He's going to keep that promise. But if we say we have not sinned, verse 10, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. Keep reading. Ignore the chapter division. My little children, these things I write to you so that you what? So that you may not sin. Does God write the New Testament to us? Does God ask us not to sin? Does God write it and say, please don't sin? Why? Because sin is contrary to the very nature of God and God cannot be associated with sin. My little children, I write these things to you so that you may not sin. And look at the middle of verse one. If anyone sins. Wait a minute, I thought you weren't supposed to sin. I thought you were a Christian and he just said, don't sin. But then he says to these Christians, but if anybody sins, what does that mean? It's a choice. And we're going to make that choice sometimes, aren't we? Here I am a Christian. I'm trying to walk in the light. I'm trying to live right and do right. But sometimes the temptations are really tempting. And sometimes the day is really hard or really long. And sometimes the person is just the right person. Or maybe they're just the wrong person. And, 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 it's gonna, and, and I am going to trespass. I am going to go beyond what God says. I'm going to miss the mark. And I sin. If anyone, is this a license to sin, by the way? Is this, a, is this God saying, hey, go ahead. You're going to do it? No, that's not what this is saying. Please don't sin. But if anyone sins, he's writing this to Christians. We have, present tense again, we continually have an advocate, a pediclesis, a, a, an advocate, a lawyer, a, a comforter, a, a one who is pleading our case. We continually have an advocate with the Father. Who is it? Jesus Christ. What are the next two words? Jesus Christ, the righteous. Am I righteous? No. Was Lot righteous? No. But with God, Lot was righteous because of God who is the righteous one. If I sin, can I still be righteous in the eyes of God? Yes, because of my advocate who is the righteous one. He himself, verse 2, is the propitiation. He is the satisfaction. He, he, is, he is that satisfying the justice of God for our sins. Not for ours only, but also for the whole world. Here's, here's the nature of God. The nature of God is holiness. What do I got? I got one minute. Nature of God is a holy God. And here I am, and God says to me, we're going to get to this, eventually in our study of the holiness of God, uh, we'll get to this in part six, maybe, of the holiness of God, if we ever get there. The Bible says in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 15 and 16, Be ye holy, for I am holy. In that same verse, it says that we are to be holy in all, not some, all of our conduct. My desire as a Christian should be to give my life to the Lord. That's what I did when I was baptized. I yielded myself. I committed myself. When I repented, I said, I don't want to live for self anymore. I want to live for the Lord. And my commitment was to walk in the light. The blood of Jesus washed away my sins when I was baptized. I was raised to walk in newness of life. But sometimes, even when I'm walking in the light, I might step off into darkness. I might tread over in a direction that I don't need to go. What does the Bible say? The Bible says God knows my heart. God knows where my heart is trying to stay. And that when I sin, chapter 2 and verse 1, that I have an advocate, Jesus Christ the righteous, who gave himself for my sins and the blood that he shed for my sins keeps on cleansing me. It's possible, maybe I should say likely, 
that you as a Christian sinned sometime between the time you woke up this morning and right now. You sinned. And the blood of Jesus just came and washed it away so that you could continue to be holy and righteous in the eyes of God. Why? Because you're perfect? Because you're good? No. Because He is. Because He's perfect. He's good. He's righteous. And if I have a heart that says I don't want to sin and I confess my sin and I'm trying to walk in the light, and I, Trina, I hope this has helped to answer some of what you brought up, that God just keeps cleansing that sin and I keep standing there in the eyes of God, pure and holy because of Him. Pat, I'm sh real quick, going to have to be quick, Pat. Yes. Yes. Look, look at Psalm 103, 11 through 14, particularly verse 14. And it, to see the beauty of the nature and the forgiveness of God. I wish we had time to look at that, but look at Psalm 103 uh, sometime today. Okay. Thank you for your good attention and participation this morning.